Hi guys, now let's quickly address the elephant in the room. So I have broken my glasses. I've ordered a couple of new pairs, but they won't be available to pick up for a few more days. But in the meantime, the show must go on. I must continue to document my adventures in film and TV, regardless of whether I can see or not. Actually, I'm not that blind. I'm a little bit short-sighted, hence the glasses. But the only difference to my life this week has been that I've had to sit a little bit closer to the television, but Apart from that, I I've done all right. But enough about that. Let's get on with why we are here. Why are we here? Ah, yes, The Shining. A story which, coincidentally, features a boy who has a kind of second sight. So, until a few weeks ago, I was just as unaware of this thing's existence as I was the TV show version of Salem's Lot from the noughties. But once I did hear about this, I was straight on it. I thought to myself, oh, wow, an extra detailed four hour plus version of The Shining. I'm there. Sign me up. But the reality of watching it was somewhat different. And it's left me feeling that sometimes we horror fans really need saving from ourselves. So I bought this from eBay. It turned up uh, in three discs in one box. Each disc is one episode of about an hour and 25 minutes. And over the course of three nights, I watched all three episodes. So it took me almost half a week to watch this thing. And I really started to feel it by the end. If I'm completely honest... Had I not been planning this review, I probably would have ducked out of this after one episode because I wasn't really enjoying it. I mean, it's it's not that it's a bad TV show. It's just a somewhat unnecessary one. I mean, to my mind, we already have all the shining we need with the novel and Kubrick's movie. Did we need a third thing? I'm not so sure, and never before had I realised just how little plot there actually is in The Shining. I mean, when you boil it down, it's just a family moving to a hotel in the wilderness. The hotel turns out to be haunted, and then the hotel persuades the husband to murder the other two, and that's it. That's, that's all the story is, but it just so happens that in the original novel, Stephen King is so good at dragging it out and getting into the characters heads and giving you extra backstory of the hotel you know he really develops what essentially is a very thin idea to me at least that's that's what i've realized now but this is a this is a writer who would eventually do an entire novel about a woman handcuffed to a bed and yet when you read that yeah, it's called gerald's game it's still very entertaining and it's it's never boring somehow but just to give you an example of how slow the TV version of The Shining moves, I remembered some timestamps in my head. So after half an hour of this, the characters are only just arriving at the Overlook. Yeah, it takes 30 bloody minutes to get up there. After an hour, employees of the Overlook are still leaving the hotel. So yeah, after 60 minutes, uh, the Torrances are still not completely on their own. And then after an hour and a half, they still have access to Sidewinder because the scenes where they're visiting a local doctor in the nearby town. So after an hour and a half of this thing, they are still not cut off from the world in the hotel. It's bonkers. Playing the role of Jack Torrance this time is Stephen Webber, but he can't compare to Jack Nicholson from the original film. That performance by Nicholson, for me, is still one of the greatest horror performances of all time. I mean, Webber's no novice as an actor. I recognised his face straight away from something. And he is a slightly more believable author than Jack Nicholson, but overall, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison of Webber and Nicholson as Jack Torrance, it would be very one-sided. A little bit better is the casting of Wendy Torrance, so we've got Rebecca De Mornay in the role this time. Now, this is an actress I vividly remember from the 90s because she was quite a big deal for a while. And I went on her filmography just after this was finished. Who am I kidding? It was right in the middle of the episodes that I went on her filmography. Some of these scenes are slow in this TV show, forgive me. Turns out, I've seen three Rebecca de Mornay films before, all from the 90s. So I've seen her in Backdraft, 
The Hand That Rocks the Cradle and Guilty as Sin. And as it turns out, all three of those things came out back to back to back in the same little pocket of time at the beginning of the 90s. So similar to Bonnie Bedelia, who I was talking about the other week in my Salem's Lot review, this is an actress who was really big for a while, had lots of recognisable things come out, and then she just kind of faded away. But I really enjoyed watching her in this because, like I said, I'd not seen her in anything for like three decades. In fact, I'd say that Rebecca de Mornay was probably my biggest pleasure out of the Shining TV show. I got to look at her for, for over four hours and at least that was something to keep me mildly entertained. That being said, she's no Wendy Torrance. For me, Shelley Duval is still the definitive Wendy. She was almost as good as Jack Nicholson in the Kubrick film. And if I had to name one Wendy, it would still be Shelley Duval, as much as I like Re Rebecca de Mornay. Dick Halloran was brilliantly cast in the Kubrick version. This time around, they've used somebody who looks like he's just walked off the set of that 90s TV show, Desmond's. And we get to see his entire journey from Miami to Colorado, every last bit of this journey is documented seemingly. We see him get onto planes and we see him getting ready and it's like we don't need all this stuff. Sometimes too much is genuinely too much. There, there is one notable scene involving Dick when he's still in a cafe in Miami. So Shawnee Smith, of all people, turns up as a waitress. This is the woman who went on to play Amanda in the Saw series. She got, she got some big fame eventually, but I'm guessing she was pretty much unknown when this came out because she's literally in one scene. This thing runs for about 260 minutes. Shawnee Smith is in one minute of those 260. And I'd like to say that she really brings this waitress character to life. She gives you more than what's on the page. But I can't, in all honesty. I'm not even sure she gets one line, if I'm completely honest. When it comes to the kid, uh, Danny Torrance, again, another downgrade. Uh, the kid from the original film, very good. But, I mean, I don't want to take the piss out of child actors, but this one is just, just not up to scratch. I'm, I'm quite certain Stanley Kubrick would not have used this kid for his film. He would have just kept the casting sessions going and said, no thanks to you. And the only other actor or character I'll, I'll mention in this section is uh, Tony the Ghost. So this is like... Danny's invisible friend. He was a really creepy character in the original novel. I'm not sure if he turns up in Kubrick's version, but in the novel, Danny could never quite see him in his imagination. He was always a person just out of view. And he was definitely one of the scariest things about the book, I would say. But in this version, they've turned him into like a chess club geek who could float in the air and stands right in front of the camera. And, and, it, and it's like, what have you done with this character? Like, as soon as he came on screen, I was like, oh God, what have they done with Tony the, Tony the Ghost? That's appalling. The best new inclusion to this version is the hedge animals, which were not used in the Kubrick one. He substituted those for a hedge maze, fair enough. But in the original novel, there were these hedge animals that went after the characters, and every time the characters turned around, the hedge animals would be still, but then when they turned around a little bit later, the hedge animals had got a little bit closer to them. It was pretty freaky, actually. And I'd say, in this version, the only time that I was even remotely creeped out was when these hedge animals were going after Jack or Danny. It was also nice to see the boiler room here and one or two other things that we didn't get with Kubrick, but there are also a bunch of stuff that's introduced in this one which doesn't work very well, mostly towards the end of the thing, in the, in the third episode. So uh, eventually Jack goes completely psychotic and picks, picks up this mallet and starts going after his, his, wife, and daughter, uh, his wife and son, but... They've tried to shoehorn way too much action in. Like, he's swinging this mallet around and only just missing them, and it's all a bit convenient after a point. It's not choreographed that well. I much preferred what Kubrick did and had Jack not actually catch up to Wendy or Danny. It was, it was a more restrained but very realistic ending. I preferred that. Also, they've gone for the big hotel explosion here, just like what happens in the novel, but it's a very obvious miniature, sadly. As soon as it was happening, I was like, C uh, converted dollhouse alert. And there's a strange finale involving like a 16-year-old Danny who's graduating. So we see Wendy sat in the audience and Danny's picking up his scroll or whatever they give you at the end of high school. And he sort of walks to the side of the stage and then just starts staring at a ghost of his dad. But he's the only one who can see him. So the rest of the room is just like, why is he just staring into space? It's just really weird. And 
To make it even worse, I, I think the guy they've cast to play the older Danny is the same chess club geek from earlier in the movie who was playing Tony. I'm sure he is. I could be wrong about that, but... There are a number of mistakes, I would say, made towards the end of this show. Um, I mean, for the finale, why didn't they just do what happens in the book and have Danny and Dick talking by the pond? That would have been absolutely fine. But at least there's some decent money in this show. I mean, they haven't cheapened out on, on all the key things. The hotel itself looks phenomenal, mainly because they've used the same Colorado hotel that Stephen King stayed in when he got the idea for The Shining. So you get all these great views of the Rockies when the characters are just having random conversations. In Kubrick's version, they used a hotel in Oregon, but the funny thing is the one in Oregon looks better than the actual Ground Zero Hotel in Colorado, weirdly enough. And there's definitely less interiors with the TV version. We spend a suspiciously large amount of time having scenes just near the elevator, for example. Kubrick had more studio space to work with, definitely. The, the biggest trouble with this TV version is I'm just not sure who it could really appeal to these days. Like, the people who are going to enjoy this the most are people living in 1997 who don't have cable because it's not been invented. And so they're watching everything that comes on and they get this three-day serial, The Shining, and it's like, oh, wow, this is pretty good. And, and they will genuinely enjoy it. But the trouble is... Those people don't exist anymore. So these days, the only people who are going to check this out, uh, and you have to sort of make an effort to watch it, uh, uh, nutters like me or insane shining enthusiasts who just have to have everything going about this story. But I just can't imagine there's that many of, of those types of people about. Time to show you the version that I own for this. So here is my DVD of the... TV show of The Shining. I picked this up from eBay for about £12, I think. Not really worth it. There is a commentary track which includes Stephen King, but it, it also has Stephen Webber, Cynthia Garris, director Mick Garris and select crew. So a lot of people show up on this commentary track. So how much Stephen King you get, I don't know, but I certainly don't have the time or the enthusiasm for this to watch a commentary track that lasts for more than four hours. But if you are a, a rare person who, who has seen the Shining TV show commentary track, then do let me know what it's like and, and how much Stephen King is on it. Also on these discs are 11 additional scenes. I mean, there could be like 20 to 25 minutes then of material that they didn't include on this. It could have been even longer. So there we have it. Um, it is available out there if, if you want to pick it up. But for now, I am going to concentrate on getting to the Bag of Terror and finding out what sort of score I'm going to give this. So we got one, two, three bloody axes out of five. I probably enjoyed it a little bit less than this, but given the context of why it was made and when it came out, it was a long time ago now, I think it's a pretty solid TV show if that's what you're after. But certainly, I probably won't ever go back to it. For me, it will it will just be Kubrick's version from this day forward. Right, that's it for today. Unless you want to stay with me an extra minute for my reading update. So I've just finished reading The Dead Zone by Stephen King. So I'm a little bit further along with the novels than I am with the adaptations. But this is a cracking read. It's about this guy who basically wakes up from a coma after four or five years under. Except now he's got this power where he can see people's futures and he's got the ability to change said futures potentially. It's a cracking read. The plotting is a little bit aimless at times, but I was certainly never bored. I'd, I'd say my two favourite passages in the thing. Firstly, when Johnny and his girlfriend Sarah go, go on this date uh, to a fairground, that was a lovely section. And also when Johnny teams up with a sheriff in a town called Castle Rock. I love that whole part of the book as well. So on the whole, I'm still going to give this four and a half out of five. It's a brilliant novel, but I'd say almost certainly not one of King's best, but I certainly don't regret reading it. It's it, extremely good. But my next one after this is not going to be another King book. It's going to be the Alien 3 novelization. So I'll let you know how I get on with that very soon. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.